Hey there everybody, it's Mark Curley. I'm back with another video. This is the latest in my ongoing series of videos about uh, storytelling and comic book creation. Just packing all of my best advice into this ongoing series of vids. Uh, today's topic is going to be world building. Uh, and as I talk about it, I'm going to be working on a, a bit of a world building drawing. This came from my uh, graphic novel series, Brody's Ghost. It's actually the uh, kind of rough uh, sketch version of this big double page spread uh, that was found in the very first um, uh, issue in the series. But let's go ahead and get on with the first piece of advice, this one, number one. Some writers start with building a world, then they write the story. Others start with a story idea, then create a world around it. Uh, just wanted to sort of point out that there's no uh, single best way of doing this. Uh, people have their own preferences. I definitely fit into that latter category of um, starting with the story idea. Uh, and then I create the world uh, to sort of support the story idea. But I know a lot of other people will actually sort of devote themselves to um, inventing uh, the world in its entirety before they even settle uh, on the story. And that's, you know, that can certainly be an interesting way of doing it, especially if you're fascinated with the process of world creation. And indeed, if you believe that there could be multiple stories, a great many stories that could uh, be told in this world that you've created, maybe that is the way to go. Start uh, with uh, focusing on the world and then just um, let the stories flow. Uh, from that. But, you know, the, the most important thing is to be true to yourself, whatever comes naturally to you. Number two here, it can be helpful to model your imaginary world off of an a, actual place that you've visited uh, in the real world. Um, definitely we see this in uh, uh, a lot of movies and stuff and say, boy, that sort of feels a little bit like... Uh, you know, uh, South America or something, you know. And uh, sure enough, the people who created it are basing it off of a particular location, a particular part of the world. Um, I put into my advice uh, some place that you've visited uh, in uh, the real world, in your real life. I think it is, you know, they say write what you know. It is generally speaking uh, best to um, have personal experience of the place, but I suppose you could be... Um, and, you know, try to write a, a, a story that has the flavor of China without ever actually having been to China, you know, to invent a world like that. you got to be careful, though, because um, if you have never been to China and you have no real uh, genuine knowledge of the place, your sort of references to China may end up being a little, you know, based on stereotypes and so forth. So um, I personally try to, if I, if I want to base a location, uh, a sort of imaginary alien environment, on some real-world place, I always make sure it's a place that I've been to myself. And uh, I understand the, the details and you know, sights and sounds of that place personally. Let's move on to number three. Don't burden your audience with prolonged exposition about the world at the beginning of the story. Uh, if such exposition is essential, treat it as a necessary evil. Now, I don't know if everyone knows the meaning of the word exposition, but that's kind of when you're just telling stuff to the audience. Um, this weekend, uh, this past weekend, I took my daughter out to see Ready Player One, and there is definitely, um, you know, like a 10-minute sequence or so at the beginning of that movie that is an, a lot of exposition. You know, the main character is sort of telling us about the world, the current state of the world in this oasis, uh, you know, all a virtual reality uh, land that everyone goes to and spends all their time in. And, uh, you know, clearly um, uh, Steven Spielberg just felt like we gotta set this up. I can't just throw you into this story. I, I, you need to understand uh, something of this world before we get on to the actual story. But uh, I say be careful, guys, because it can be tempting to go on and on and on about setting up uh, this world that you find fascinating, but your uh, audience is sort of like eager for you to just come on, tell me a story, give me a character that uh, and doing something that I care about. Uh, let's get on with the actual storytelling. So uh, for sure, be uh, cautious about that. And like I said, I would say treat it as a necessary evil. Keep it as short and sweet as you can. Uh, you know, a good example, I think, is the very first Star Wars movie. I know I refer to Star Wars a lot, but I, I figure it's I can count on it, that being something that everyone has seen. Uh, so we have a uh, common uh, reference point there. But the very first Star Wars movie, apart from those 
three paragraphs of yellow text, there is no exposition at the beginning of that story. George Lucas just threw us into it. We don't really know what's going on. Who are these robots? What's going to happen next? And you know what? It's fascinating. And it works. And uh, generally speaking, people enjoy having to figure it out without having it spoon-fed to them uh, by way of all this exposition. Uh, and especially if, if your exposition is entirely related to just telling people about the world that this story is taking place in, that can really put people to sleep <laughs> awfully fast. So I think I've made my point there. And talk about going on too long. <laughs> I'm going on too long. Let's go on to number four. It's important to establish the rules of the world. What is and isn't possible. It does seem like almost every uh, world building um, you know, project involves coming up with the rules of the world uh, and uh, uh, you have to be very careful about deciding at the outset um, how does this world work, you know? What can uh, happen, what cannot happen uh, in this world? And um, if you um, violate those rules, well, that's going to be the uh, subject of our very next piece of advice. But uh, I would just say um, give a, a very careful thought. Uh, to coming up with the rules of your world and think about the limitations that you are setting on yourself with these rules so that you won't have to attempt to violate them later on. You know, if you, let's say for example, you imagine a world in which no one is able to speak, right? Uh, all information is conveyed by way of sign language. Well, you're, you are creating a tough uh, storytelling challenge for yourself there. Uh, it can be done, but just be aware that of what you're doing to yourself as a storyteller. No one in your story is ever going to be able to utter a word of speech. It's going to be a challenge, right? So uh, that's just an example of, of what I would say is a, a very tough um, rule to establish at the outset. Um, generally speaking, I would never um, set such a... a stringent limitation on myself uh, from the outside. outside. Maybe one character, like Groot, for example. There's an excellent example. Here's this one character who uh, is extremely limited uh, in terms of vocabulary, but the rest of them <laughs> can say whatever they feel. Let's move on to number five. If the audience feels you're breaking the rules of your own world, they will be disappointed or even angry. Um, you got to be super cautious about uh, establishing rules and then uh, breaking them later on out of sort of storytelling convenience. Uh, audiences hate when you do that. And um, like I said, you, you, the fandom can actually become angry. And I do think that, you know, uh, some of you know this latest uh, uh, Star Wars film, The Last Jedi. Um, there was kind of a backlash against... Uh, the film in general, or, or certain parts of it, because they just felt that uh, it was breaking the rules as they understood them, the uh, some members of the audience, I'm saying here, um, breaking the rules of the Star Wars universe. And uh, people get very, um, you know, <laughs> angry when they feel that the rules are being disregarded by the creator of the story. Um, so uh, whether you agree with that assessment of... Um, Last Jedi or not, and uh, I think there's ample argument uh, in that case on both sides uh, as to whether that movie is or is not breaking Star Wars uh, world-building rules, so to speak. Um, one thing we can all agree on is that people care very deeply. Uh, fans care very deeply about the so-called rules uh, of the world that you've built, and so um, make sure that you uh, I'm not saying you can never break them, but be very careful about breaking them and, and understanding what it is that you're doing when you break one of the rules that you yourself <laughs> have created uh, for the story. Let's move on now to number six. Masters of world building uh, know how to keep the world building stuff in the background. The story is the star. The world building provides atmosphere, mood, etc. Uh, and yes, I think sometimes uh, we can become, as creative people, we're so eager to kind of show off this world 
uh, that we've created that we start making the world the star of the show and we forget uh, to tell a story of any kind. It's just all about exploring this fun little sandbox of a world uh, that we've made. I suppose it's possible to, to tell a good story that way, but I, I think in general it's more effective when all that world building stuff is kept in the background and sort of glimpsed in, in, in tiny bits here and there. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner uh, from the 1980s is an excellent example of uh, story or of world building. People have been trying to match it, I feel, almost ever since trying to do world building so good as was done in that movie and I think a big part of it was that uh, Ridley Scott kept most of that world building stuff in the background. We were just sort of seeing little bits and pieces and we're like, wow, look at the the neon umbrella stands, you know, and different stuff like that. Um, that you could just sense, boy, a lot of thought has gone into this world. But no, we're not sitting, we're not standing around talking about the umbrellas, <laughs> right? We're not calling a lot of attention to these things. There's going to be another uh, uh, piece of advice that sort of dovetails with this later on. But uh, certainly keeping it in the background, allowing the world building to be the, the atmosphere, uh, the mood, uh, that's what I think is the really masterful uh, world building where it, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't want to be the star. It, it wants to play this supporting of role of, of giving you uh, a sense of location and uh, just leaving it at that. All right, let's move on to number seven. Not all worlds have to be 100% believable. They just need to be consistent. If believability is your goal, you need logic to stand behind every world-building decision you make. Um, so let's we'll break this into two here. The first one, uh, not all worlds have to be 100% believable. Um, certainly in a lot of classic children's uh, films like The Wizard of Oz or Willy Wonka, um, believability is not the goal. There, it's a, there's this sense of whimsy. and um, But there is consistency, right? We feel that Willy Wonka uh, in The Chocolate Factory or... Um, the uh, Wizard of Oz are consistent, that they are, they sort of come from the brain of a single person and that we don't suddenly have some wildly out of place visual element that doesn't seem to fit. Um, but to get into the second part of it, if believability is your goal, then you're, you need to stop and really think things through. And I've seen a lot of people who, who uh, sort, sort of focused on world building um, will get people to say, well, what about the economy of this world that you've created? How do people earn a living? Uh, stuff like that, right? To get you to really think about, you know, what is the, what the, what are the religious uh, underpinnings of this world? Uh, all of that, the sort of nuts and bolts, the politics and so forth. Um, that these things, um, if you want a believable world, maybe you need to give some thought to some of this stuff that's maybe not necessarily the fun part, uh, of world building, but if you want it to be believable, you have to stop and say, well, yeah, how, how do these people make a living? You know, um, to go back to Star Wars quickly, uh, I always thought it was interesting that they, uh, that Luke uh, worked on a, a moisture farm, right? Like he, they had they'd come up with this idea of uh, in a desert landscape uh, where there is never rain or whatever, that uh, getting the uh, Getting water out of the air, I believe, was the idea, uh, became a sort of way of making a living. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just rings true. You just you feel like, yeah, that makes sense. People would do that for a living uh, if your only way of getting uh, moisture was from the air. Anyway, something worth considering. Let's move on to number eight. It's tempting to focus mainly on visuals, but don't forget the other senses. How do things in this world sound, smell? taste, feel. Uh, these other elements um, uh, can really uh, add so much to your world building. Uh, get some reference in there to a smell. Uh, you know, when I did a series called Akiko back in the 1990s, I had this stuff called brapa, what's it called? Brapa meat or something like that. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the smell of it was supposed to be really awful. Hang on, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm forgetting the name of my own thing. <laughs> I better go back and check that. Hang on a second. 
Yes, well, sorry about that. I thought I was saying it wrong. It was uh, Bropka, the Bropka lizards. Uh, these animals that had a terrible smell. And I was probably influenced a little bit from Star Wars, the second one, um, uh, Empire Strikes Back, where they cut open that animal and the guts smell really bad, and you have uh, Han Solo make the joke about, I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Um, it was It's a great joke. But it also is, uh, introduces this extra sense of smell uh, into the Star Wars universe and, and just makes it that much more real. So um, we do tend to focus on the um, visuals. You can see, that, of course, this whole video is devoted to an, uh, this visual uh, location uh, that I spent a lot of time developing with Brody's Ghost to, to really make you feel that it was a lived-in actual world. Um, but don't forget about those other senses, the sounds, you know, uh, the smells, what things taste like, and so forth, uh, can really add that final extra development uh, or uh, element to your world that makes it really come alive. Now let's move on to number nine. Details are crucial. They can be especially effective if introduced casually without calling too much attention to them. Uh, this is what I started to talk about a little bit earlier. Uh, with uh, the Blade Runner idea of, of things just being tossed in um, in a casual way that clearly had a lot of thought put into them. Um, but they're not like saying, hey everybody, look at this cool thing. Uh, if you can have the self-discipline to sort of casually have it in there and the reader or the viewer just almost kind of glimpses it out of the corner of their eye, it becomes even more effective. But yes, details. Um, nobody wants a generic world um, that doesn't have the, uh, the detail of reality, you know. And when you see that someone has put in all those extra little tiny uh, objects or, uh, as I was saying a moment ago, sights and sounds and different things like that, all these little smaller elements uh, are going to be the key to making your uh, world come alive. But as I said, I, I'm a big fan of the people who sort of do it casually. Um, take the time to work this stuff out, but they don't shine a spotlight on it. They just sort of um, let the person kind of be impressed with it to the degree to which you did not call attention to it. Let's move on now. We're getting closer to the end. Number 10. You should give thought to the history slash backstory of the world you've created, but be careful about laying too much of this material on the audience. Now this, uh, again, seems a little bit like what I said before about exposition uh, at the beginning of the story. Um, this is maybe more uh, for in the middle of the story, you may be tempted to start talking about the history of everything. Uh, and I myself, as a uh, viewer uh, of entertainment, it's I have very low tolerance for, for prolonged explanation of the history. Uh, and if, if indeed you've worked out uh, the history of this location and you're sort of entranced with it and are eager for the audience to know everything about the history of it, you can fall prey to this um, deadly dull <laughs> storytelling impulse in which everything grinds to a halt and we just listen to some older character tell us about the history. Um, I would say be very cautious about that. Um, you know, working out the history allows there to be a sense of reality, but maybe a lot of it should just be something that you know uh, as the writer, and the audience doesn't need to know it. Or you sort of dole it out very slowly. I certainly would not want to have one scene that goes on and on and on that spells out the entire history of the whole world. Um, like I said, it just my experience as a viewer uh, or as a reader is that my eyes just glaze over. It's like, oh, really? Are we going to just stop and have this character go on, give us a history lesson? <laughs> you know. Um, to use yet again to return to Star Wars because I'm, I'm sure everyone remembers it in the first movie. They have uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi talk just very briefly um, about the past, right? You know, this, this the lightsaber was a more elegant uh, weapon for a more civilized age. You know, he's just hinting at it. He's not going to go into it at length and say, well, let me tell you about that civilized age, Luke. 
I'll pull out this chart on the wall and give you a little lesson. No, he just gave you a, uh, just a little drop of it, and you're like, oh, wow, there, things used to be more civilized. Interesting, you know. That's, for me, that's the way to do it. Give me just little hints of the history. Don't, don't spend uh, minutes upon minutes of someone telling us at length um, a history lesson. We're getting closer to the end. Before I do, though, before I get to my last two, I'm going to pull out my beloved white gouache, an opaque white paint, and just uh, switch to adding uh, white highlights. Okay, so I decided to time-lapse through uh, a bit of my white gouaching <laughs> so as to have this illustration looking a little more finished uh, by the time we get to the end of the video, and we are getting ever so close to the end of the video. Let's move on now to number 11. Uh, many creators find it useful to draw a map of the world they've uh, created, establishing the distances between various locations. Um, I actually was enlisted uh, by Jeff Smith to uh, create a map. You know, it was his design, but I just did the illustration of it um, for his uh, classic uh, comic book series, Bone. Uh, hang on, let me see if I can find uh, that and uh, show it to you right now. So yes, this is Bone, one of the greatest uh, comic book stories ever written. Uh, comes to us from Jeff Smith. If you've never read it, you definitely need to check it out. And Jeff came to me and uh, hired me to create this map that goes at the back of the book. It shows all the different locations uh, and kind of shows the journey that the characters take as they make their way from the upper left of the map all the way down uh, to the lower right. And so I thought this was a good example to show you. Uh, if you are so inclined to create an actual map of your world uh, it can be helpful for you as a creative person uh, to understand where everything is, and I think readers uh, enjoy seeing a map, um, uh, and, and it just brings an air of reality to it, you know, um, as they can look at the different locations and say, oh yeah, this is like an, an actual country, you know, that someone has uh, planned out and, and made real. And uh, I guess that brings us now uh, to the final piece of advice, number 12. Beware of getting too obsessed with the world building. Many aspiring writers spend years designing their world and then never get around to writing an actual story. I thought I would just wind up with this little cautionary note here. There is something seductive about the process of world building and uh, sometimes people just get pulled so deeply into it um, that it almost becomes an excuse to not write the story. And um, I would say definitely between the two, writing the story is the key thing. This is what's going to allow you to reach readers and, and um, uh, show people what you can do uh, as a creative person. Uh, devoting so much energy to planning out uh, the world and then never actually um, creating any kind of a story, that just seems a shame to me, a wasted opportunity. Uh, I suppose if you have fun with it and it becomes more like a hobby to you and you never intend to publish anything, there's uh, nothing wrong with that. It brings you enjoyment. But uh, just a, a word of warning to those of you. Uh, if you've spent, I would say, any more than six or seven months on world building without writing the story, I'd say, come on, get on with it. Just start writing a story. Give us some characters. Give us a journey, uh, a, a struggle for that character to undertake. And, uh, you know, the, the world building can wait. Uh, you can figure it out as you go along once you start writing the story. But hang on, I do want to grab my books so that I can say thank you to anyone who has supported me by getting them, like Brody's Ghost, the graphic novel that that illustration came from, The Drawing Lesson, a graphic novel that teaches you how to draw, manga art, my book filled with uh, illustrations in the manga style, and my very latest book, Chibi, already getting uh, kind words from people who have ordered and received this book. Thank you so much for your support. I'm so glad to hear that you are enjoying it. But I think it's time for me to lay down this pencil. Not an asparagus this time, folks. 
that is a reference to my April Fool's video. If you missed it, I will put a link to it uh, in the description of this video. But let's go ahead and end this one. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back with another one real soon.